and it gave me a much greater respect about what was going on and an appreciation because we look in our world with all this fantastic technology behind us right here and I have to tell you something the technology inside our body is far greater oh, than the technology in this world that we can't live in our world, our technology is so rough and crude, and inside, think about it, you have 50 trillion individual entities living in your skin, under your skin, in harmony, where every entity is an individual being, every cell has a job, everybody contributes to the whole, and they're all different specialized jobs, some are heart cells, some are muscle cells, some are, are like uh, uh, the immune system, like the medical cells that take care of us, and there are protection cells, and there are cells that take out the garbage, and, and basically there's this whole living thing going on, and what's interesting is, here we live on this planet with about six billion people and we're killing ourselves with six billion people and inside our body are 50 trillion individuals living in harmony and when you're in health and happiness and ecstasy let's say that means 50 trillion citizens are sharing that immediate joy and what's really wonderful being the electron microscopist is to see their technology their technology exceeds everything that we're doing on this planet. They manage the environment, they filter the air, they clean the water, they, uh, they, 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 just, they do far greater things with their technology than we have learned. And yet it's very interesting because as an electron microscopist, I can tell you, when we do a technology in our outer world, it's ba basically very redundant to the technology that our cells develop. So it's very interesting because I think where do we get these ideas that scientists and people have about to create this technology, I think they get them from the community of cells, that our cellular community talks to us and that we can understand our own selves and those ideas become translated into the physical world that we live in. What's the great hope for me about it? If you can get 50 trillion cells to live in harmony, enjoy every day of life and, and live in that, uh, that joy, we have a lot to learn out here and they are the pattern that we need to look at. Because we can understand how they have an economy, which they do. They exchange energy. They work. They, they have children, small cells growing up in large cells. Everything we're doing, they do already. And the idea is they do it right. And they've been doing it for a million years. And we're having a problem, you know, well, not actually a million years. They've been doing it for, well, since the uh, cells started about three billion years ago. But in communities, cells started forming communities about 575 million years ago. And it's a community. This is not just a bunch of cells. Cells learn how to harmonize and specialize and do their special work together and share their environment and share their, their fortunes and share everything. And this is the kind of lesson that if we could learn on this world today, if we could live in anywhere half the happiness and efficiency of our cells and our body, then we wouldn't be facing any of the problems that we face on this, pro on, on this planet right now. Draw breath. <laughs> You're so passionate. I, I love it. You are so passionate about, well, they, they, about the cells. But I've got to wind up here because I've got to go to a break. Oh. <laughs> but when we come back, we'll find out more about you. Are oh, you're so passionate, and that's the thing I love about your presentation. Biology is about life. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Stay with us. It gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, and I hope you are thoroughly enjoying this very passionate discussion on cells and biology. And there's so many questions, and I often say that, and I kind of sit here getting mesmerized at all the information that you're imparting. Getting back to your journey, your personal journey, what did your mum and dad do? Well, uh, my mother and father owned a supermarket, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, uh, I was involved with that when I was like, uh, everyone in our family worked in that market. So. When I was five years old, I got my first job, 
And that was in the old days where all the soda bottles were return bottles. And, and so as a five-year-old, uh, when all the bottles came in the supermarket in the back, my job was to match the bottles in the crates and put them back in. So all the Coca-Cola bottles went in the Coca-Cola cases and the Pepsi bottles. And I started with that job. And by the time I finished high school and started college, I was uh, a delivery boy which I enjoy because uh, I'd get to put all the groceries in the back of the truck and then drive all through the country all day long and there wasn't any better job than that than just uh, driving around the, driving around beautiful uh, upstate New York. It was very pretty. Alrighty, well, we're going to fast forward now to this moment in time. If someone said to you to describe what Biology of Belief is about in 10 words or less, <laughs> <laughs> here's a challenge. Seriously though, how would you describe this simplistically put for people that aren't aware of your work? Yes. Uh, simplistically put, it's a change from our belief system of uh, being victims to the world and forces outside of ourselves mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to be the victims of our genes and our heredity to recognizing what we think and what we feel about our, our lives control our health. And why this becomes important is that when we're in a pathological situation, it's, we always tend to blame the body. You know, something's wrong with the body and it turns out, no, the body is just a reflection of what's going on in your mind. And as uh, we change our beliefs and our attitudes about life, we change our biology. And this allows people to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we talk about the placebo effect, where good thoughts can actually heal yourself in the presence of a sugar pill. Uh, but it also uh, brings in something that most people aren't familiar with called the nocebo effect. It's just the opposite. It says a negative thought can actually cause illness and even kill you uh, just because of the belief. So while beliefs can heal you, Negative beliefs can kill you, so positive and negative beliefs are equally powerful, but in opposite directions. Because we can actually scare ourselves to death, can't we? That's an absolute physiological reality that yep. we do this. And, and uh, interesting fact about new science is that 90% uh, of cardiovascular disease changeable by changing lifestyle. Mm -hmm. The American Cancer Society just last year recognized that over 60% of cancer is totally avoidable by changing lifestyle. The most recent evidence on diabetes reveals that it's a lifestyle disease. By changing lifestyle, you can actually wean yourself off the insulin and become healthy again. So for years, we've attributed our illnesses to a, a frailty of the machinery. The new biology takes us out of that and says, no, we are very much responsible for this. And without being programmed and taught that, that responsibility, uh, we blindly walk through the world uh, feeling ourselves victims. But it turns out if we're victims, it's only of our own belief systems. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because the, um, the subtitle is Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Matter and Miracles. Now, I also believe that when you started tapping into this other level of understanding of bringing um, the science with, uh, with spirituality and biology, that you took some time out to get your life together. Oh, yes. Well, it was a very important part because uh, what I started to realize is I was standing in front of audiences, mm -hmm. giving them the science about how they could control their lives. And then I'd see people in the audience sort of cock their heads and look at me and go, you know, for a guy who says he knows, he knows what's going on, your life doesn't look that good, Lipton. And I started feeling like, oh my God, I'm standing at the front telling people that they control their lives and my life was nothing that I was proud of at that time. What is this? Uh, these were, I would say, from about 1983 to about 1986 or so. So what was happening in your life that wasn't matching what you were sharing with the world? Well, I had, uh, you know, my personal relationships weren't of the best. I wasn't making really any money and my health was questionable a lot. And there I am trying to tell people, here you are, you can be this powerful. And obviously I wasn't the best spokesman, but I realized what the problem was. And the problem was that this information that I acquired was, a, was like an academic learning in my conscious mind. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the fact that our subconscious mind controls us. So I realized I'm operating off of my old belief systems even though my knowledge in my conscious mind is of new science. So I talk from my conscious mind about the new science and then live my life with my old belief systems and that's why uh, I was always in the same pattern. So the exciting part was when I recognized that was to say well, rather than talking this talk, it's walking the talk.